Welcome back, folks, to this part of Let's Play Resident Evil 4. In the last part, we got confronted- well, actually, no, I skip over all the cutscenes, so fuck all that. Alright, yeah. So anyway, this is a pure just... game. This is pretty much pure game, no cutscene run of Resident Evil 4. And the reason I'm doing this is because I, I think I've walked through this game like four times already. And through editing, replaying, I think I've watched all the cutscenes of this game at least a total of like at least 25 times. Alright. So now next up is one of the trickier things I'm going to try to do. This is a bit of a conservation strategy on my part. First of all, oh, this isn't a... Wait, I know that li there are bottles of wine later on you can break, but apparently you can't break that one. Alright. Shit. Alright. This is a strategy, and to do this, you have to isolate the Dr. Salvador and very slowly open that door. If you do this right, the only person that will come is the Chainsaw Man. And when this guy is isolated, you can do more damage again. You can uh, more easily simply knife him to death. Now this is very risky, and it requires a great deal of understanding of how the AI in this game works. The AI in this game sort of attacks. It. The AI basically flinches in this game. It will always flinch in this game, and that's something you don't usually see. Like. The enemies attack based on when they think you're going to hit them. And because of that, if you run at them, they're going to already start swinging. Now, admittedly, you think they'd learn after a while, but at the same time, you know, these guys aren't exactly the highest functioning thinkers. And there, I just beat Dr. Salvador. With absolutely no, <clears throat> with no bullets used. Alright. Now I'm not going to call this a minimum bullet run or anything. Because like, I'm, I'm probably going to be held to a higher standard than I should be. Considering how casual this is intended to be. But. Fuck! Yeah, and a, mi a minimum bullet run. Whatever, whatever the criteria for that may be. I'm sure not getting hit would be part of it because think about it if you're being this conservative it should be it should have a bit of reward other than you know simply having more ammo and I think that's what a lot of people uh, for a lot of people like just makes them kind of infuriating when they see how I play because it's like you have all this ammo but you don't use it in many ways, it's sort of the, if I were in your shoes, I would take advantage of what I don't usually have in my game. Because I've heard and seen other people play this game, and they have, like, no ammo. Damn it! And the funny thing is, because it's causing me to take so many risks, I am... It, the benefits are not quite as visible as they may seem. Alright. And, uh, yeah. But thankfully, I have a bunch of easy health items that I can very easily get just get rid of. I'm gonna sh now, this is actually an interesting bit of AI programming here. These enemies here, they can all see me, but they will only all come at me once I shoot within a certain range. So the result is, if you very gingerly walk towards them, and then very slowly back away, you could fight them one at a time. Unless you fire, like within and within pretty darn close range because I just fired a shot and that didn't trigger them the uh, you know They will not come after you Not only that because of the way they're layered how they're pretty much just one after the other not necessarily like just like not uh, Not in just one line One can see you at a time So unless you're like vaulting towards them at mock speed you're, they're, they're not all going to come after you. And this can be very beneficial if you're having a strategy like much like mine, where you're attempting to single each of them out, and then trying to beat them with no ammo used. 
Alright. So let's walk very gingerly towards them. And this is where it can be very beneficial. Because now I'm dealing with an enemy with a weapon. And this weapon, I think, has hit me more times than anything else. Except perhaps uh, someone who just does a sudden lunge. Alright. And uh, there's also minor AI differences between the enemies in this game on difficulties. The There seems to be a radius around Leon where most enemies will stop running at you and ju instead just start walking very gingerly. Much in the same way that perhaps if you had an opponent in front of you but you didn't quite can like understand what a, how much of a threat he was, you might try to assess the situation and try to figure out well how close should I be and like what angle can I come at him with. And it actually makes a lot more sense with these guys because these guys attack in groups. Okay well not these guys because I just took them out one by one with just a knife. But in this next part, where they all know you're there immediately, they all completely stop their business, and I believe up to two th people will come at you. Okay, never mind, a lot more than that. I mean, like, call out your name. Wow. Alright, now this is very tricky, but you can get... You can hit a lot of people with a lot of melee attacks without really having to attack more than one of them. Directly, I mean. Because this is such a cramped area that enemies will very often get very, very close to you. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. The AI is messing with me. Sometimes when the stun of kicking one opponent kicks in, fuck, you can, you can sometimes knife an enemy and hit them once again, and hit them with a kick. And this can be very useful when they're in groups, but it's also very, very high risk. Because if you don't run at them fast enough, they will be able to hit you. This area is particularly difficult in harder difficulties where oftentimes one hit can kill you. And I notice the AI is kind of tricky whenever the the ground isn't perfectly level. For example, this is a little bit slanted. And for some reason, the AI just seems a little bit different. I think it just perceives your distance a little bit differently than it usually would. So yes. I've taken care of all the enemies that will run at me. There's no point in checking any of the cabins. Except for one, because I've already taken all the items from earlier in the game. This is where... Sometimes items you missed, you could check them or get them, but however, I missed nothing. I refuse to believe that I ever missed something. Yeah, this guy, you can knock him off the roof. However, I believe in professional difficulty, uh, he is much more difficult to knock down. So watch out for that. Anyway, and I believe that should turn off the nasty music. It does not. So that means there is one more enemy in this area that I am not aware of. Yes, there he is. Okay. So, it's a little bit tr tricky to hit enemies while they're across windowsills. It was very thank or it's it was very lucky that he was actually taking out the weapon as I was trying to kick him because if I if he already had it out, he probably would have hurt me quite badly. So anyway, I'm going to patch up my wounds with these uh tuna fish that I cooked up or I should say black bass. And I'm going to put away the TMP ammo. However, I have no plans of actually using the TMP ammo. Uh, what I always do with the TMP ammo is I sell it. Because I've played this game with the TMP before. And it really doesn't seem like it's worth it. Because there's just not enough TMP ammo. You'll find it and you'll, okay, you know, if you really, really need it, you'll have it. But... It's just not enough to justify having or buying the TMP. Especially considering the TMP is one of the few weapons in the game that you can't find a free version of. And that's something that, like, for for me, it's always interesting what, to f what people find as a flaw in a game. Like, I'm sure people are going to say that a very slow... A uh, game that may be very deliberately slow-paced, like, say... Um... <clears throat> Silent Hill, the Silent Hill game, or really any horror game, may it may be brought upon it as a negative that the game is so very slow-paced. 
and it may just not be that it's slow paced it's that that just doesn't fit with for what that person wants and uh, the thing about me is that I'm sort of a l no flaws I don't or like I'm sort of a what is there anything to take away from the thing but anyway before I continue on game philosophy ideas I'm gonna have to talk about this shotgun here's the thing this shotgun this is the last point at which you can get it once it turns nighttime the shotgun disappears and I keep putting up the map. Uh, okay, so the shotgun, how much room does it take? It takes up a great deal of room. And I need to get rid of some stuff. So it looks like I'm going to have to sacrifice my black bass. So sorry. So sorry, you're going to have to be eaten by somebody else. Whoever takes up this house again. Okay. I may cut forward. Okay, so I've reorganized everything and now I have room for the shotgun. So anyway, I believe I was talking about game design philosophies and many people seem to really like the Super Mario Brothers 3 philosophy on game design, which is, okay, well that's not its official name, that's just like my prime example of this type of game and that is a kitchen sink approach. A very, very slow burn of everything that could possibly be done in a game and I'm not sure if I'm really fond of that because the result because with the way Super Mario Bros. 3 works is that you have a set amount of mechanics and just a, a couple of gimmicks that uh, that aren't directly tied to the mechanics there are different ways in which you can improve your being and that could work except for the fact that they are very much limited now you could argue that is that is an incentive to for the player to explore, but in many in many times it's just it, it seems too dangerous to explore, and I'm not sure whether or not it could feel rewarding to go against that danger, especially in some cases where uh, the very very easy hidden feat is, for example, in that game just. Like, you'll find a Tanuki suit, and then the harder ones, well, they're coins. What? You know. Got something that might and I'm gonna not. You. I did not skip that cutscene, because it's Got a selection cool. of. Anyway, he tells us once again about the Blue Medallion, and he also quiet. gives us the offer to tune up our weapons. The shotgun, I will tune up until I get the. Uh, the shotgun known as a striker. Is that, is that, is that However. <laughs> uh, Thank you. I will not uh, upgrade to the riot gun because it costs too much to buy the riot gun and then upgrade it again. The handgun, I will get a very what good replacement buying? very, very soon. So anyway, we now have the option to buy a TMP uh, stock, which will uh, eliminate much of the selling? recoil. Is but we will not be using any TMP <laughs> and you. none of the TMP ammo. Sometimes I like to sell <laughs> the healing <laughs> items. However, I'm a little bit iffier about that. Considering uh, my current God. format is a bit more relaxed, <laughs> you. Or, you know, relaxed, and I'm not quite in the mental state uh, to be completely stringent about my health. Anyway, so yeah, the this is the difficult. What the? How did I press that? That was odd. But anyway. As I've said, the struggle for a lot of games is, you know, how do you, for a lot of times, how do you make it feel rewarding to to, ex uh, to explore, uh, to take so much effort to explore, I should say. And with Mario Brothers 3, it's kind of very similar things. It's just, you get another chance to use this nice little gimmick suit. And I understand that philosophy with a lot of, or and, and I understand a lot of people really do uh, like the idea of like almost an arcade style experience where it's just like, yeah, we found this lucky little thing. And oh dear. Okay, so we're out of room, but that's all right. You can reload, and there's no more room. Wunderbar. So let's see. Well. I could use bullets, but I don't want to. Hmm. 
Perhaps I will just leave this hand grenade here, and just in case I lose any health, I will eat a black bass, if that's the case. So, and I'm sure you noticed the blue medallion on the left side there. And the blue medallion, if you shoot it, will, can get us a Punisher. And getting all 15, I believe I have said this before, will give us a free upgrade. Although I don't think he mentions it. I believe you... One of the things he just said was, Detrás de ti, imbécil. This actually translates to behind you, you idiot. I recall that... I think a big part of the, the reason some people find this game actually scary... I, I don't think this game is scary, but I know some people do is uh, one, one part of it is almost the foreigner aspect, where you're surrounded by people who you outright do not understand. Um, and even though I do quite like this game, I've never really thought it was scary. I, I, I've heard people say, oh, it's kind of chilling, and I'm like, the atmosphere actually is kind of chilling, but the thing is, it, it almost comes off like a, like a black comedy, so, sort of like Young Frankenstein, where like, the atmosphere and, like, the environment does feel like something out of a horror movie. But, like, your character- the characters don't. And I think for some people where it actually does feel scary is the- as I said, the foreigner part- aspect of it. Anyway, shoot this. Dynamite. And easy kill. A, and, as I've said, it's a foreigner aspect. Well, I actually know what these characters are saying, so... There is no foreign... While the foreigner aspect for, of it is there, you know, anytime you're in a place where you just don't recognize the style, the surroundings, um, there is a bit of foreigner aspect to it. But, for me, that's just not scary, and I think part of it is the fact that I know what they're saying, so there's a... There is no disconnect of who they are and what they want and what I'm hearing. You know, it's just like, there, for me, there is no question of what do they want. You know, they say, ahí está. You, uh, he's there. And, you know, immediately dropped, immediately continued by trying to murder me. This is a puzzle from hell. People, like, I know a lot of people who thought they got stuck because they, like, couldn't pass this puzzle. This is not a mandatory puzzle, but it is one of the ways to get a treasure. The combination is 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Four, four, four. Three. Want to know how I figured that out? I looked it up. I looked it up and then I kept looking it up for my first playthroughs until, like, I eventually memorized it, um, by attrition, basically. And, yeah. Don't, a lot of times I, I have to wonder with people, like, do you have any sense of shame for needing to look something up? But anyway, uh, I believe this is something that, because a lot of people just walk by, they often miss this. Is that Hunnigan actually calls you. Hunnigan, it's Leon. The door's locked. I can't get in. Didn't they teach you how to pick locks at the academy? Yeah. There's some sort of indentation, like something might fit inside. Well, there's no use standing around. Leon, you have to find some way or something to get inside. Alright, and this is a very interesting keyhole, to be say the least. Anyway... Um... Pff, I think I've said all that needs to be said about Mario Bros. 3-based game design. And the reason I kept saying that was because that game was about giving the player as much as they wanted or as much as they could possibly earn. Whereas this game feels a lot more like it's about giving the player what they like all the essentials and a few things that that like basically satisfy a a particular need that could that usually really likes other games of this, uh, like other games with these mechanics. But the core thing that you pretty much never can miss, as in the, the handguns, all still work within the style of this game. Like, the things that stand out are the things that are kind of useless, but also kind of cool. Like, the mind thrower. That weapon is so worthless in battle, but it's kind of cool. You know, but it, it does sort of feel tacked on. 
you know, but again, it's not intrusive, it's not in the way, and it's not something you absolutely need. You know, you don't like it? Why the fuck did you buy it? Well, I guess, I guess there's always that problem of you don't truly know what you need when you first play a game. And oh dear, we've run into another situation where we're out, where we don't have any room. And it looks like I'm gonna have to keep this egg here. Alright. And what else was I gonna say? So yeah. And also, I, I think I described Mario as a slow burn. Where I, I think, because I think there's not enough variety in the mechanics, there's just variety in, like, excess, in, there, there's like, the difference in variety is too small, whereas here, the variety is just, is a lot wider, or, like, to some extent, it's a lot wider, to some extent, it's just, it's just off and different. But the main thing is that it feels different. You know, fighting a giant monster or, you know, fighting any of the dozens of giant monsters in this feels like a much more slow and meticulous battle than many of the village scenes, which just come off like, um, which come off much more fast paced. And there is something to be said about uh, the absorbing quality of pacing. If something feels very, very fast paced, but then you're given the time to really just slow down and absorb everything that's around you, a lot of times a game can just suck you in with that. It can really just make you feel as if you just do not want to leave the game. You do not want to leave the controller in your hands. Games that kind of do this by accident, uh, or do this because, like, the player gets accustomed to the rhythm of the game, are, are games that, or the ones that do this the most easily, I think, are RPGs, because, like, they, they play the game for so long that they eventually get accustomed to just the way the game plays, so then when there's any kind of progression in the plot or in the character's, uh, skills, you know, it feels, it actually does feel like an accomplishment because they know how much it feels like to just, uh, slog it out for so darn long. And this is, I, I think, a reason why some RPGs have, del I, I think some RPGs might have deliberately somewhat forgettable first halves. Like, I was playing Final Fantasy VII uh, earlier today, and I kind of, when I was thinking back on how I was playing it, I was like, I really didn't care about the game during the first half, but then after the second half it actually started to open up to me a lot more when my progress seemed like it was going much faster what are you buying so anyway for shooting all those medallions we got this little weapon what are you buying you will find it here and it is for for zero pesetas now this gun has a free upgrade and compared to our stock handgun it is stronger and barely reloads any slower. Actually, no. Actually, no. It's it's pretty much better in every way. So what I'm going to what do now selling? is sell my handgun. Is that old stranger? <laughs> and <laughs> buy the Punisher, or get the free Punisher, I should say. Takes up the exact same amount of space, and it's just better overall. It's not my permanent handgun, but you can't argue with free. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you can. It's just what are you dumb. What are you selling? All right. So now we can just sell Is all the little you jewels we found. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I guess not all the little jewels. <laughs> okay. So now we got the two cat's eyes, the red and green cat's eye, and that, the, that's for the beer stein. The elegant mask. Um, we're going to need three jewels for that, and I believe I've already said that one of the jewels is gonna show how unnecessarily meticulous I can be at times. Because that's gonna take me a long time to get the two jewels for the elegant mask. It's not necessary, but damn it, it's what I do. That's what I do. It's what I do. Okay, so now more handgun ammo that I have no room for. Lovely! Okay, and a hand grenade that I don't have room for. More awesome -o. Now I believe 
the, uh, if you missed it, well, here it is again. Anyway, the boulder. The boulder has got a problem. You're mashing the buttons way too hard, and it's not allowing the boulder to shine. You're burying the boulder. Anyway, I gotta wonder how many people are actually know what that little reference was to. Anyway, collecting the spinal. And now this little area. This is weirdly serene just out of the... So much fog. Almost like Silent Hill-ish. And it's just ridiculous uh, yes, amount of fog. Anyway. If you can make the... Yes! This is one thing that's quite nice about this... Uh, about... This area is that there's traps put everywhere. And the traps that are everywhere, like, cannot, are, unlike in some other games where only you can ever trigger traps, no, enemies can also trigger traps. At all times. And now you'll notice that there's something over there on the ground. If you might be able to notice it, it's actually a hand grenade, which I believe I've already iterated I have absolutely no room for. So instead, I shall move over here, because I think I saw a snake. Yes, but it has moved over there. It has run away, li it has run away like a coward. And speaking of snakes, if you look in this area, this box, one of them has a snake. And I will try to kill it, and there I go. I believe it'll give me a free egg, which I have no room for, Wunderbart. But such is life. Sometimes you get stuff that you just don't need. And TMP. Well, that would have made nice moonies, but I don't need it. Whoa. Anyway, there's a little ramp off here to get to the left side of the water, and that man just made an easy path for me to access to further on if I need it. But, did he drop anything? Doesn't seem like it. And the guy who I just killed did not drop anything either. So now, let's see what'll happen. Uh, no room for the hand grenade. I should have really expected that. And now more enemies are coming down. If I don't miss... Oh wow, they spawned right there. Now one thing you may want to encourage is uh, allowing them to just walk around in the water. Because a lot of times they'll, tr they'll just trigger traps by just wandering. For example, I'm really hoping... Okay, yes, that man will eventually trigger that trap. So, I'm hoping... Well, I don't know if, like, enough people will be around it. That's a word. Fuck. Alright. Well, yes, now we can move freely. I move freely. Alright. So now... Get the bass fish. Got a nice collection of people and we kick them I sort of delayed my kick there uh, but that's not always the safest thing because the, the timing on the stun states is always different oh dang it so no, alright now I need more health so the bass is actually pretty good for healing us at this state but it it's going to be out ah it's going to be outclassed by the you know what the tool is right here i'm going to use it it's soon going to be very much outclassed by the much better red plus green herbs however red herbs are a little bit rarer this early in the game i have one or i have already one concoction made but this early, not too many. But once enough yellow herbs expand our health. So yes, now I'm using my guns, and this is because I'm in a bit of a claustrophobic situation. And the game has, in spite of being ported to the PS3 and Xbox 360, the game seems to still have a bunch of slowdown. And I thought that was one of the things you're supposed to remove when you up when you update these ports. And I believe this is actually something I I'm actually thinking of making a topic video on, and that's like, what makes a game, 
what makes a game that should be ported and updated or what's the difference between a game that should be ported and updated and a game that should be totally remade for example a game that should be remade for me is actually Resident Evil 2 because I think it's a very flawed game that has a lot of great ideas and I think those are the types of games I would want to remake. Alright, sorry. I almost got interrupted again. Anyway, crap in a little bit of a corner. Don't worry, I'm a calf killer. And just knocked off that man's hat. And I believe I was talking about remakes and updated ports. Like this game should—I don't think this game should be remade. While it do, while it is flawed, it executes on its ideas well enough. But a game like Resident Evil 2, the problem with it is, it has ideas that it kind of ignores. Like the idea of exploring a full city in the zombie apocalypse is present. But it's mostly just there to just explore Umbrella again. It feels almost like it's a retread of the first game, but with a different backdrop. You know, and I of course people have said that, it, like that's the big problem with Resident Evil, that it's the same narrative, again and again and again. You know, pretty much just the Resident Evil one, uh, set or like different settings. Uh, different settings, but the same uh, story being told. Uh, essentially, I should say. Anyway, I want my back to the the empty lot because I don't want to be have my back to the. Oh no! I don't want to have my back to the dynamite because if I trigger that, that's gonna ha give me a bad time. Damn it! These guys are doing the lunge attack really often now, and I think it's... Yep, I've run out of really easy health items. Not that it matters much, I believe this is the last uh, non-boss enemy in this chapter. So we're almost done with this chapter, guys. So we're almost home free, but we got one boss left, and I believe you already know who it is, because if you're watching this and don't know what happens in this game, that might be a problem, especially since I've been skipping all the cutscenes. Alright, remember, don't stop Bo leaving. And I believe this is another snake one. Yep. And a white chicken egg. We've been getting rather bland chicken eggs in this one. I have not gotten a golden chicken egg, I believe, or a brown, or no, I've gotten a brown chicken egg, just not a, a, a golden one. But anyway, we are now going to approach the final area of the game. Or, and not the final area of the game, the final area of this chapter. Anyway, now this is not... I, right, currently what I am approaching is an optional area. I will skip the cutscene because I don't need to. And Oh! Hey! I didn't need to actually trigger the cutscene for it to, to get that item. Alright. I got the red herb. Quite beneficial. And now, you will notice a nest coming from this tree. Shoot that down, and we get a gold bangle with pearls. I thought it was diamonds. Anyway. And I'm trying to collect more ammo, but thankfully this time I have room for it by combining it with a green herb. So now I've got a good, uh, decent array. Ooh, a yellow herb. And a yellow herb, I believe I've said this, ooh, so good with a green one. And I don't combine the red, green, yellow because I don't want to wait for the situation. I don't want to waste a red herb by waiting until the... Or I don't want to waste a red herb by basically uh, forcing myself to or like by choosing to eat the the I, I don't want to wait for to oh wait I have room 
this is sort of hard to explain, but I don't want to wait to have no health to want to expand my my health, so or to expand my stamina. So, if I like just lose one chunk, I'm gonna use this to regain uh, my health. The green and yellow herbs. So now we are on a boat now, and this controls purely with the sticks. And if you press R1 on the PS3 version, we can use a harpoon. Which, of course, we're not going to get any use out of. I mean, what, what can you really use with a harpoon? Well, really, since I'm not... Well, since I'm skipping all the cutscenes, I think... Uh, I'll just tell you. That giant alligator or fish or whatever. It, yeah, it, it found out that I killed its brother, so it's mad. So I'm going to move forward. Uh... Friggin' hell, where is the... Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. There's a certain zone that if you cross, you trigger the boss battle. It's pretty much just intended to stop you from accidentally skipping ahead and getting one of the keys. Timing your attacks to not accidentally uh, hit him, or, yeah, timing your attacks to be able to not get hit by him is very, very tricky. Anyway, he's Let's let him come out. And uh yes, yeah, so Leon will be shaken up sometimes by by him coming out of the water too gingerly. And now he'll just casually go down. I have no idea what he's planning here, but you can kinda see him coming a mile away. Sort of tricky to see him in the water though, because it's all murky. What the heck? I have no idea what he's planned. There is actually a way to one hit kill him, but I've never ever done it myself. Just throw harpoons at him. You're, you're gonna gradually break him down. He's not gonna realize that just directly attacking you is the best means. Or perhaps it's not wise because the rope doesn't look like it's very long. Just go away from him. And eventually he'll try to turn around and immediately bite at you. But he will not do it. And oh no! Yep, knocked down. Once you're knocked out of the water, you have a quick time event to try to get back in. Swim too slow, and your fish through. It's hard to wonder why exactly he does not just simply eat the boat. But whatever, he has a fish brain. No. This is difficult to tell on high definition TV, so I can't imagine. I can't remember how hard it was to do it on standard definition TVs. So I remember I, it was just guesswork. I, I would just go look anywhere and just look for the arrows. But I guess I'm relying upon Leon's hearing. Anyway. Eventually. Oh wait, no, I, I can see up the cutscenes. Ah, but there's the quick time event of sadness. Yeah, mash them buttons. And I got it just fine. So anyway, yes, yeah, skip this cutscene. And now we can continue. Alright, and as you can see, I actually have a pretty good uh, hit ratio at 97%. Much better than my previous two outings, which were much worse. And I will take this time to say thanks for watching this part of Let's Play Resident Evil 4. And next time, we're going to continue on to Chapter 2-1, when sudden, suddenly, nighttime. See you guys, a then.